I don't like doing my own home repairs. And when I made some videos that honestly show how much I don't like it, they seem to help a lot of other guys like me. So I thought it would be good to make this new set of videos. Guys like me have a million questions for the progressive activists that we see on the news. But nobody on TV ever asks those questions. On CNN, the host probably agrees with the activists, so his questions are weak. And on Fox News, the host just tries to make them look bad. Either way, nobody's asking the questions that might actually help us get a feel for where they're coming from, so we might actually understand them a little better. It's no surprise that people who disagree over politics are so angry at each other nowadays. So right before Christmas, me and my brother, who is himself progressive, we drove around the West and did our own interviews. We drove to 22 cities and interviewed dozens of people who support progressive causes to ask those questions that are never asked. We're not trying to change our mind or make them look bad. We just want to understand where they're coming from. These folks were brave considering what can happen nowadays if you say one wrong thing on YouTube. And we talked about a lot of really sensitive subjects. So just leave right now if these conversations might offend you. If you stay though, I think you'll hear some things you've never heard before and have a better understanding of your fellow Americans. I did. From Puebla, we drove to Berthoud where we talked to 60s activist, venture capitalist, and author Rennie Davis. His influence on the protests at the 1968 Democratic National Convention in Chicago and later in the record-breaking 1971 May Day protest in Washington placed him at the white-hot center of the American Cultural Revolution of the 1960s. I understand you have a new book out. Can you tell me a little bit about it? I do. Well, uh, you know, I'm looking around and I'm noticing the possibility of a rare social phenomenon could happen. There have been times when people came together and changed the world. The Renaissance was an example, you know, and, and generally what happens is that just millions of people suddenly come together and unite. And typically they have no idea what they're about to do just before they go out and do it. The 60s was another example. I mean, in January 1960, uh, we had tens of millions of people, most of them in their 20s that basically set out to change the world. But in January 1960, you couldn't find anybody who, who understood what they were about to do. You know, and the American Revolution was another example. Uh, everybody's sitting on the fence and this one person, his name is Thomas Paine, you know, decides to write this incinerary pamphlet that just ignites everybody and, and, and it literally changes the world. So. So this is the book, uh, it's called The New Humanity, A Movement to Change the World. It's actually a trilogy. It starts with the 60s so that people in their 20s uh, really can see how that happened. You know, it's not so much one side or the other, it's just, it's this phenomenon of people coming together for change that really occasionally can happen. And so this is really pretty great 60s stories if anybody wants to learn how, how it happened then. But the, the trilogy is really about the state of the world today and then what we could do about it, you know, in the third book. So that's the plan. I remember in some of your promotional materials, you made reference to the lunch counter at Woolworths being one of the triggering points for the um, civil rights movement. And you mentioned now the election of Donald Trump as being a kind of a tr triggering moment for what may be a, a new humanity, a new revolution. What is it about the election of Donald Trump that triggers uh, folks, in your opinion? Well, the first thing I would say is that I grew up in rural Virginia, you know, and where I grew up, I um, mean, if a person was nervous, he, he was referred to as a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. I mean, that's how people talked. And I, I loved my community, I really did. And yet it was really entrenched in a deep racism. Uh, I went to an all-white high school myself, and I was pretty clueless about how severe it was, you know, I, I, I really, <laughs> I was not tuned in at all, you know. And then, you know, a civil rights movement happened and, and basically there was, there was illegal segregation ended in the United States, although racism certainly didn't end at all. So um, now we come to this moment and you see this divided country where basically I mean, the w one indication is the Women's March the day after the inauguration. It may have been the biggest protest in the history of our world, 
okay, on the day after Trump was elected. And then you have people in rural Virginia, in my neighbors, and also I went to school in Ohio, and I went to school in Michigan, and there were people there who just are dumbfounded that, that there's so much opposition to Trump. What, what's, what's the problem here? And so I think the deep river really is that we, we are moving into a time of separation that has no bounds. I mean, for me personally, America energetically is no longer a country anymore. We, we absolutely are not talking to each other. At the same time, uh, neither the progressives or the conservatives, and it's not just the United States, it's worldwide, really seem to grasp what's coming. It, it's really interesting to me, you know, I mean, maybe progressives are a little more tuned into the fact that, you know, we have environmental crisis, but people don't get that our oceans are dying. And, and people really don't understand it affects their own immediate life that our rainforests are in peril. Or that it has something, that the, the fact that there's, you know, the largest e extinction of species in the past 65 million years is occurring right now today is like, you know, so what? You know, I mean, civilization's fine. And so what I'm interested in is getting ready for what's coming. And that's, that's the movement that I see is going to come together. I don't care if you're conservative or you're Democrat. When, when a tornado comes through town or a hurricane levels Houston, you, you know, it really doesn't matter what label you have. You're going to, most people really pitch in and help each other. And that, that's the state of the future that I see coming. Are you satisfied that there is no ambiguity, that these predictions that are dire are correct? Well, I, I think they're much worse than any prediction, to be honest with you. I mean, let's, let's, let's say what, see what the consensus of science is about the rising of the oceans. I mean, uh, everyone agrees, you know, maybe 99% of the scientists of the world agree that Greenland is melting. They also agree that the oceans will rise 20 feet when it completely melts. But the conservative broad consensus is that's going to be no, no, at the end of the century. So we can kind of, you know, it's not our, our watch. <laughs> you know, we don't have to worry about that. My own opinion, okay, is that we have 20 years to put it together. And then it's really too late. Uh, I don't really choose to argue with people who basically want to deny the science or argue or think it's still out, you know. That's their belief system. The skepticism I have is based on Things like, well, you know, I, I tried the low-fat diet for 30 years and kept getting fatter and fatter and fatter until I started doing the low-carb diet, right? right? So I'm really angry at the guy who came up with that food pyramid back in the 70s. I'm really angry at him. Right. I'm really angry at the people that told my father, you know, years before his death, uh, low-salt diet will reduce blood pressure. Absolutely, completely debunked at this point. I mean, I'm sure there's people who grew up in high-rise urban redevelopment the ones that are all being demolished now as horrific failures. I'm sure all of them are very upset at whatever genius came up with the prognosis that this is what we do for urban renewal. So what do you say to people who have that kind of skepticism? How, how does your predictions of dire predictions rate in certitude against those things that were, you know, just debacles of misunderstanding in the past? Yeah, I pretty much agree with you. I really do. I, I can make my list too. And we'd probably share, you know, yeah, that was a disaster. That didn't go so well. But the real question is, what do we do at this point? You know, and so I, I step out with a fairly strong understanding that we actually have to change ourselves. We have to stop looking to political parties, governments, and institutions to basically figure it out because they won't. They're tied themselves to the society as well. And, and we need to actually change our own awareness. So let me give an example. But there was a time in the 16th century when every human being on Earth, without exception, absolutely knew for sure that the Earth was stationary in space and the Sun orbited the Earth. And then one man, his name was Nicholas Copernicus, 
okay, made the argument that everybody on earth is misinformed. Now, not everybody agreed with him at the beginning, and he was controversial, but it turned out that there really was a paradigm shift in the understanding of the reality in which we live. So now we come to another moment like the 16th century. We are absolutely, as a species, utterly convinced that our problems are all caused by the somebody or something outside ourself. So Trump did it. You know, he did it, she did it, my ex-spouse, that, that's the real problem in my life, you know. And, and yet what is occurring right now in the world is a group of people who are discovering that the entire nature of reality is misinformed. The best example is really the field of particle physics. There you have uh, electrons speeding around this huge track, you know, and, and, and they, they can see that their own thought affects the outcome of any experiment that they do. And they have hard evidence that basically the, the physical world morphs and shapeshifts to our own perceptions and our own thoughts. And so what is occurring is a millions of people are actually making this discovery that no one is doing anything to you. And no one has ever done anything to you. Every single problem that you have and every experience of your life down to the tiniest detail has its origins in the 60,000 thoughts that cross your own brain every 24 hours. Now that is, that's as absurd as one man saying, hey, everybody on earth is misinformed. The, the, the earth actually orbits the sun. That's the way it is today, but I would say, watch what happens 100 years from now. The, we are, as a species, going to have a group of people lead the way to truly understand that by changing yourself, you can change the world. It's not a little thing. It, it's a very big thing it's, it, with huge details and, and information about what an awareness is where, where basically you you're really don't do judgment or blame or finger pointing. I mean, when you blame someone else, you, know, you don't realize that the anger that you feel registers in your own body chemistry. And your own body thinks it's being judged by you, the owner. <laughs> and so why would you ever want to do that? Why would you want to you know, beat yourself on the back you know, by basically hating Trump or hating anybody for that matter when hate basically is the destructive force inside yourself. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if I heard the answer to, to my question, which was uh, with regard to uh, the, the dire predictions. In your mind, that's, a, that's an unambiguous truth at this point? The science is settled on that? Well, it's more than science, you know. I would say that if you basically get out of your, uh, out of your collective thinking, how humans, see. you know, we're all in collectives. We, we have philosophies that we hold to. So a conservative philosophy might be, well, you know, science is just, you know, silly. It's not really happening. And so you hear this in your neighbors, your politicians reinforce this. I mean, how, how are you supposed to actually figure it out when you're a farmer out there, you know, and hearing the, the world? Well, I would suggest you might want to just go out and notice and pay attention to your own fields, okay? Notice what's happening to the soil, okay? This year, 25 million acres of topsoil just blew away. The, the amount of soil that blew away in China versus the amount of replenishment was 57 to one, okay? Now, this is the six inches beneath our feet is <laughs> the foundation of civilization and is blowing away. Okay. And so if, you know, are we in a moment like no other? Are, is the science pretty well calling it, although very conservatively, in my opinion? Yeah, I, I would say so. But, but I'm not here to make an argument. I, I really am not. What I know, here's what I know. There are probably 350 million people in the world who agree fully with me that we have to change ourselves to have a future at all as a species. And so I'm interested in talking to them. 
I'm interested in connecting ourselves together into a global family. And the events are coming, okay? They're gonna knock on your door and then we'll have a talk then, okay? When global warming blows your door down, you'll get the picture, okay? Until that time, you know, we're gonna stay with our philosophies. And so I, I don't think we need to really have fist fights about it, honestly. You know, we're, we're past the point of global warming. We still think that there's still time to avert what's coming. And actually, we've run out of time. We, we're already past the point of no return. We need to get ready for what's coming. We're going to have mass migrations in this country, the United States of America. We're, we're going to see a situation unlike anything on the planet has ever experienced ever and uh, it's a combination of science it's a combination of intuition and it's a combination of just plain common sense by paying attention to little things and not basically being not so unpresent that i don't really see what's happening all around me okay do you talk more about this in your new book, The New Humanity? Yeah, right, exactly. More okay. and more in the, the second book is really about, you know, a layman's understanding of all the science pulled together in one place. And that will sober you up. I mean, that's all I can say. You know, if you approach it with an open mind, it's hard to find any place. All the science, see, you say cl climate change or global warming. I, I, global warming is the tip of the iceberg. You know, it's so much more. The big problem is the human race. The big problem is the level of, we've exceeded our load limit on the planet. That's really my greatest concern. And so I don't suggest that we should get rid of humans. I just say the nature of the earth. I spent four years at the bottom of the Grand Canyon where I didn't really talk to anybody and I just listened to the earth. And what I understood is that the nature of the earth is the balance. And when you have a species that is out of balance, the earth will rebalance and rebalance and regeneration of the planet is what is the fundamental driving force of everything that's going to occur in our own lifetime. Okay. Have you read the credible um, or credible sources who disagree with that? Have you made the comparison yourself? I, I have, yeah, I, I have. And, and you reject and their argument? I do. I, you know, okay. for the most part, I really feel like it's, it's often what you find is that the, the credible science in quotes is really funded by Exxon or some major oil company. Right, and, but that's and, kind of, you know, let's just stop the name calling and get back to the argument. Can, no, I'm not, in, I'm in not addition really, to impugning their motives, can you also rebut I'm, I'm, what their I'm, statements I'm, are? I'm not really repudiating anybody's motives. I'm just pointing out that this is the case. Oh, that we have the funding, science, I think, we impugns have people their motives. declaring this is good science, that when you look at their funding, it, it just becomes clear that, that, that it is driven by oil and profitability. And it's not really, uh, you, you know, I, I don't know what to say. I would say that 98% of the scientific world believes the earth is warming up. Now, you can say, yeah, but what about the 2%? And that's fine, you, you know. Well, you said that, yourself Copernicus was the contrarian who was right. Yeah, and, and, and that's, that's true, but I would invite you to open your eyes, okay? Our oceans are dying. If you think that you, ha you and your five children are going to have a future on this planet with no ocean life, that, which is now being predicted will be over in your lifetime. No, okay? I, I agree. I intend fully to read. I'll find the best pro and the best anti and read them both. Right. And, uh, and, and, you know, see where, see, the, see where they land. I would love to go to those yeah. original sources. Yeah. Well, you know what? I happen to love people in rural Virginia. I, I really do. And, and people who voted for Trump are not my enemy. They really are human beings to me. I mean, truly, they are. I see you as a respectful person. You know, and you may come from a conservative point of view, but that doesn't mean that I feel that you're wrong and I'm right. You know, I, I really don't go that way. What I do, I like, why would I do this video then with you? Okay, because there are millions and millions of people who absolutely know 
who will see this video that, that the only way out is for us to change yourself. So I'm not trying to change you. I'm trying to change myself. Okay, and by changing myself, I step into an unconditional respect. I can send out an, an invisible influence that, that is powerful in the world, but until I basically say, well, I respect you, but I don't respect you. And so there is a beginning, an early beginning of a quiet revolution that is truly devoted to changing ourself. And that's my family. It doesn't mean you're not in my family. I just say, I'm gonna to talk to you through events. So I predict, okay, that events are coming that are gonna change your point of view 180 degrees along with the rest of the human race. So then, then the real question is, what then? Will we turn on each other and kill ourselves off as a species? Or will there be a community of people who create a pathway that can walk out and actually create a nation that does not perish from the earth? And so that's really my point of view. You've said um, that um, you'd like to be an agent to kind of bulldoze down the fear and divide that you see happening in the country now. What do you mean by fear and divide? Now here, I think you can basically put us all together, progressives and conservatives alike, you know. I think the, the number one emotion on this planet is fear. And that I believe that fear is currently peaking for all times in human history. It is greater than World War II. It is greater than World War I. It is greater than the Inquisitions in the Middle Ages. It has a lot to do with a number of people who are in fear. But if I had a technology that could be a fear meter, it would just go off the chart right now on this planet. When you understand that every thought and every emotion is what's creating the world that we live in, we're, we're creating our own world and fear is the dominant thought that's coming through the human race, the outcome is inevitable. You know, and so unless there's an antigen to fear, that, that then basically it's, it's already over. I mean, there's a big discussion about, well, civilization will prevail over the rise of terrorism, okay? And I would say that unless there's a, a millions and millions of people come together to create a life on this planet, real life, I mean, the real deal, life, okay, and understand what that is and know how to generate it out of themselves, that, that terrorism is going to win this battle, okay, of civilization. Terrorism is truly on the march, you know, and we, we, we're so confident in our civilization, we take it so for granted, but it's actually very fragile. Okay, so when you said fear, it reminded me immediately of all the observations I've seen. People say that, well, the... Um, the reason that President Trump is the president now is because of fear, because people fear the unknown. They fear, they fear that things are changing and things are getting out of hand. And it's always funny when I hear that observation, I say, well, yes, that is exactly right. People are afraid. And what's wrong with that? I think fear is a wonderful motivator. I think fear helps us respond to things that aren't going well. Here's just one, just as an example. And it's a volatile one. Uh, is there any justification for people being afraid that uh, immigration at too high a rate is going to impact their wages and their schools and maybe their medical system and, and who knows what else? Well, you know, I, I really agree that fear and divide, okay, that's basically I'm here, you're there, you're screwed up, I have all the right answers, that, that, that approach to life is basically what did elect not only Donald Trump, but, but, you know, kind of a nationalism movement that's occurring all over the world. You know, everybody for themselves, everybody return to their tribe, everybody basically gather around the white people, gather around the Muslim people, gather around whatever your race or tribe is, and your identity, and, and hold on for dear life because they're coming to get you. Okay, if I can interrupt for a second. So you do believe that race and religion then are the primary appeals to fear that are going on right now? 
No, I think we just latch on to whatever is convenient and whatever we know in our life, okay? My tribe is white, okay? Therefore, everybody who's not white is against me. Well, okay? but I don't hear anybody making that political argument. No, nobody makes that argument, but at a deep level. So okay? you're saying these are dog whistles. We're just, because yeah. he's plain spoken and says things like, uh, you know, Mexicans are coming in and some of them are good people, but there's rapists coming in and all that. Because he says stuff like that, which, you know, if you want to take in the worst possible interpretation, then I suppose you can say, well, he's just insulted the entire Mexican people. You know, you're saying that those are the signals that he's sending out to racists that are saying, be with me and I will assuage your fears of these other people. Is that kind of what you're, I mean, is that where well, you're coming from on this? No, it's not where I'm coming from. That would be an observation I would make. That, that that kind of behavior is growing by leaps and bounds okay. right now in the world. So then let me pivot to what I wanted to get to. I don't see that. What I see is people being afraid of their jobs, afraid of their schools, afraid of you know wages. Where I'm from in Phoenix, there's some places you can't get a job unless you speak Spanish. And it's like, okay, well, that's cool, that's new. I guess that's good, but I mean, you know, if I'm if I'm a guy that doesn't speak Spanish and my kids, you know, are going to be going to the workforce, do I now have to start worrying? I better make sure they know how to speak Spanish. This is a new concern that we haven't had to be concerned about before. So well, is that not a legitimate fear? Yeah, no, it's legitimate as long as you believe that the world outside yourself is really going to get you. So in other words, I'm saying that's a misunderstanding on the level of Copernicus. How so? Don't we all compete for... No, basically we create our own reality out of our own thoughts and perceptions. If you see everything through the eyes of fear, whatever you attract is what you're going to experience. So if you basically live in fear, you're going to draw to yourself fear. If, if you condemn Trump or condemn progressives or condemn whoever, okay, whatever you're condemning is what you're going to experience. That's what I'm saying is the actual physics of our planet. And it is beginning to be supported by the field of particle physics. And so what, here's an idea for you in Phoenix, okay, is, is to basically change, put all of your thoughts on a default setting and do this for one month and get your own evidence if this is true or not. So if for one month, and you don't fake it, you really feel it, everything that comes in front of you, no matter what, is going to be better than anything that you could possibly imagine. And you really feel this for one month, I, I will say it's going to set your hair on fire. You're going to see magic occur. You're going to see that any person can create their own reality by changing their own perception. And so, yes, I mean, you can say fear and divide is sweeping the world and don't you think that's justified? That's, that's, that's an understanding of reality that's misinformed. That's all I'm saying. Now, it happens to be the whole human history. You've got a lot going for you, if that's what you think. Everybody thinks the same way. I'm just saying that there are pioneers of the human race right now in the world who basically are going with a completely different view. That is my own thoughts and my own perceptions that's creating the experiences of my life. Okay. No, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. And I would think it is, at, you know, people who are at a certain level of accomplishment, uh, maybe the mental prowess to be able to do that, the discipline, um, that's great advice. Um, do you, I mean, do you, do you genuinely believe this is something the, for the common man? I do. I really do. I just think that it's not going to be done by philosophical arguments. It's going to be done by evidence that basically when, when Phoenix can't eat, okay, or it's just too hot to, to bear, and there's actually a, all these little showcase communities all over the place where people are living and thriving, and, and basically they all are living their lives on the principles that I'm talking about. Okay. And, and so the principles are respect. And collaboration. Okay. A purely, I'm sorry, let's yeah. finish your thought. Well, I would say that uh, we're going to build a new nation on Earth. 
and and it's going to be based on a new stage of awareness and and can anybody come in and do this it's it's not i'm not saying that it's easy okay for example a lot of people are just so conditioned to their drama and trauma okay and drama and trauma really does not work at all in a new way of living and, and so that that person has to come to a place where they're they're humble enough that they're willing to try something new as long as there's just confidence that the whole world is bad except for them and that's that's their piece of cake that's what they want to eat okay then then i wish them well i really do but it's not it's it's i would say uh we'll meet you down the road because humility is going to be coming your way it, it just the old way of believing that outside events he did it she did it you know my ex-spouse is the problem the democrats the republicans that's the, really the misery of my life okay is a complete misunderstanding in physics the physics of this reality this place this world is a psychological construct whose origin is myself okay so here's here's an objection that i i i almost hesitate to even bring up to you of all people because you well you're responsible for the biggest protest ever on may 1st 1971 right the, the biggest arrest, mass arrest you, you single-handedly practically stopped Lyndon Johnson from r running for re-election, which, by the way, all the conservatives in the world, thank you very much for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. We get along in some things. <laughs> but, but you have effected amazing changes. And what you're talking about is at such an elevated level, I'm tempted to say, this is great. He was able to effect amazing change, so naturally that's his perspective. Can you give can you give a sop of, you know, what what do you suggest for those of us who can't perceive that this is possible? Well, I think as we begin, I mean, we're at a very early stage of a new stage of awareness coming into the world. We we I recognize that, and so uh, in Bill, we call it the new humanity. This uh, it's a new species in a way. It's still human beings, but basically it doesn't buy that that the, the, the bad angel part of us is somehow our nature. It basically doesn't buy that negative egos are inevitable. It doesn't see any of that. It's just that it has an understanding of how to find an ego, name it, check it, and let it go. And so you might not know, know how to do that. Most people in the world don't know how to do that. But there's a group of people, thousands, who really do know how to do that. It's our responsibility at the same time to reach out and do some things that no one else seems to be able to do in conventional society. We're, our first step out as a new nation is to build a new wellness system. And, and so basically we think returning to optimal wellness is really our, our first step. And so I look around this country and I would say opioid addictions is really a, a driving force that no one seems able to really handle. So uh, here you have FDA that has approved a drug that is now being launched by the pharmaceutical industry that FDA is supposed to regulate that's killing 91 people a day. So uh, there, there's something wrong with that. And so we have an approach to opioid addictions that basically will absolutely stop the addiction in one week. And then there needs to be some regeneration, some, some love, support, and, and some work. Okay, but it's, it's, you're just recovering. You're coming back to a new you. And so we think that we're going to be very popular in West Virginia and Ohio and Trump country uh, with this particular therapy. We also are affordable, okay? When you list what we do, we don't have any side effects because we, we're so beyond meds, we're, we're completely into nature. But we have the diagnostic technology that lets the body become the doctor and tell you what's going on with you, okay? And so it's a completely new system. It's a new society. It's a new way of living. And so over time, you'll get to choose. Okay, you'll 
you'll be facing your own arguments that basically global change isn't really real and look at this science over here and you'll go through that until basically just events are overwhelming. Food insecurity is coming when 25 million acres of topsoil blow away every year. That is just, it's inevitable, you know, and it's actually coming very, very quickly. So with, you know, an ability, I mean, we could come into Phoenix and we could create an agricultural system where everybody in a community could live and thrive. Where while everybody else is dependent on big supermarkets and, and you know, the institutions of society are struggling. So I don't know. Yeah, we may be criticized and seen as strange or different. I, I realize that, you know, but, but we're on to something. We're on to a path that could really be the future of the human race, where it could survive on this planet and actually love each other and get along in the process. I think the global economy is over, myself, and that basically the, the economic model of the future is going to be a community, but communities that network with each other. And, and, and share their creative experiences and so forth. But I think returning to real intimacy, okay, where a community cares about each other and it's not any longer an individual family doing the best they can. You know, it really is a village. I mean, it really does support children and upbringing and everything, but it has know-how that is not available right now. So there's no cost for energy. There's no cost for Oh, well, I mean, some cost, but not, not much, really. I'm so glad you brought that up because it gets to a fundamental where I think we, we do disagree on. Um, I, I love how Ayn Rand, in describing Soviet Russia, says, you know what? Your economy is going to be based on something. It's either going to be based on money, you know, this abstraction in which we trade goods and services, or it's going to be based on pull. Who has influence? Who can get you the good apartment? Who can get oh, you yeah. permission oh, to buy pull. the thing? Yeah, pull, right. yeah. Right. Okay. Crony, right? So, and, and both of those kind of take it as an assumption that, you know what? People will always respond to self-interest. I think that's where conservatives differ greatly from progressives, is we have this, like, drilled into our heads that ain't nobody going to do you no favors. World don't owe you a, li owe you a living. You just got to do it all yourself. You got to blame yourself for everything. You got to take responsibility for everything because there ain't no free lunch, et cetera, et cetera. What you're describing sounds like it requires a different type of human nature. To me, yeah. it does. Uh, I would say that, that your perception of the world, that if one thing doesn't get me, something else will. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. That, that basically, you know, that perception, which is very basic, it's not just conservatives, but it, it tends to be strong there, it is what you then experience. So the evidence appears for your belief system. So if you think, if, if one thing doesn't get me, something else will, and that's your real constant mantra every day, that's the life that you experience. So now here I'm challenging that fundamental precept. I'm saying that no, if you could change your thoughts and, and disregard for 30 days that if one thing doesn't, anything that can go wrong will go wrong, okay? And instead for 30 days, everything's gonna be better than anything you could possibly imagine. And, and, and get your own evidence. If you could actually do that for 30 days, you begin to see that events, change, magic happens. Little, I mean, it's, it's, you probably have experience where you're going along and suddenly everything falls into place. It, ha it certainly happens for people on occasions, you know, it can. What I'm saying is that it happens all the time if you change yourself. Now, this might not be something that your listeners are really tuned to. It might not be what you're tuned to. It just happens to be the physics of our world. That's all. And, and that's everything. So it's really the how things work. Now, what we have to do is find people who agree, of which there's millions and millions and hundreds of millions, and basically start to create showcases or demonstrations 
So here's a place right outside of Phoenix where people are living and thriving and having a beautiful time and, and no one's attacking each other and they, they do get support from each other and everybody's kind of, everybody's an individual. It's not groupthink in any way. It's not a philosophy that everybody don't follow this as my new religion. That's not it. It's, it's actually a new stage of awareness that produces real experiences that are beautiful. And so if we can showcase this in next to Phoenix, while Phoenix itself is imploding, you and I may have a real discussion. Okay. Um, practical question. Is there any example you can point to that even approached, you know, doing, uh, having this kind of a success in the way that you describe? No, there really isn't. Okay. This is a new stage of awareness. And this is not an awareness that's been on the planet before. I'm not saying that there haven't been people that have done pretty well with unconditional respect and, and have followed some of these tenets. But, but the, the, there's know-how that's coming into the world right now that's never been here before. So, you know, even the great teachers, okay, really didn't have any knowledge of how to find an ego. I mean, everybody thinks there's one ego, but there's thousands of egos. How do you find them? Where, where do they hide? We, we have no idea how our human body really works. We, we don't know what the subconscious is or the unconscious or how it got created or, or what the human body possesses in itself. I mean, our body contains an archive that contains every single detail of the entire history of our experience. And so if you wanted to know who came before humans, you, you don't have to basically speculate with theory, you know, oh, oh we come right. from the ocean or we came from the big ape or, or no, we came from God in 10,000 years ago. You don't have to do any of those things. The body already has the precise information in its archive, but it takes an awareness to know how to listen to your body and to get that information. And that awareness just changes everything. Okay, great. So ends this interview in the Drive to Understand series. Rennie Davis is a great interview. Here's a guy who's worked side by side with John Lennon on anti-war strategies. Some of the decisions he made in the run-up to the 68 convention in Chicago had an impact on the world most of us couldn't match in five lifetimes. I mean, if you want progressive credentials, you can't get better than Rennie Davis. And here's the point I want to make. Even though he thinks Trump voters are making a mistake, he doesn't insult us. He won't try to shut you up or accuse you of bad things. That's an example that today's activists could learn from. I hope you may want to support this series by liking the video and subscribing to the channel. Thanks.